Yeah. So we are very happy to have Jacob Matern of University of Oregon talking to us about singular Hodge theory for combinatorial geometries. Take it away. Oh, well, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So this one will be um, faster than the previous talk, but I still think that, uh, I mean, I, I plan on starting from the beginning and you should sort of see um, some of the same things that you saw before. I'm gonna repeat some things. Okay. All right, so um, don't worry if you don't know any of these words, I'll explain everything. Um, so this is work that's in two papers, this one and this one, and I highlighted this one because this is sort of the main paper. And the other one is sort of some preliminaries that we need. They're of independent interest, but they're, they're preliminaries that we need for the main paper. So this is joint work with Tom Braden, Jun He, Nick Proudfoot, and Botong Wong. So here's what I want to do. Um, so I've already told you, but I don't assume that you've come to the pre-seminar, two problems about matroids. I'm gonna stick to hyperplane arrangements in this talk because I feel like they're sort of um, less abstract, more tangible. Um, so the two problems I'm going to tell you about hyperplane arrangements, one is called the top heavy conjecture. And one is about these kajan lustig polynomials having non-negative coefficients. So I'll explain everything. These two conjectures, um, I'll tell you the proofs of them for hyperplane arrangements, and it'll involve some topology and algebraic geometry. In the third part of the talk, I'll, since I say the word kajan lustig polynomial, I'll compare this kajan lustig polynomial for hyperplane arrangements in matroids to the classical kajan lustig theory for bio groups and flag varieties and Schubert varieties. And in part four of the talk, um, I'll tell you about our recent proof of these two conjectures for all matroids instead of just realizable or representable ones. Okay, so let's start. So part one, let me describe these two problems for you. So I'm gonna start with V being a vector space. I really don't care what field it's over, but it should be finite dimensional. And A is gonna be a finite set of hyperplanes So hyperplane just means something of dimension one less than the dimension of the vector space. With the intersection of all of these hyperplanes being the origin. So if I intersect them all, I get the or origin. So here, so if you've come to the pre-seminar, I'm sort of defining things from a different angle. Okay, but it's all the same. So a definition of flat is any subspace gotten by intersecting the hyperplanes. So any subspace of the vector space obtained by intersecting some hyperplanes. Okay. So here's the first example. So let's start with a two dimensional vector space. This is my vector space V. And I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna put three hyperplanes, which means uh, three lines inside of this vector space, all intersecting at the origin. So this is hyperplane one, hyperplane two, hyperplane three. And I want to organize the information of all of these flats, all of these subspaces I get by intersecting these lines in a lattice. So I'm gonna call this L of A, this is called the lattice of flats of the hyperplane arrangement. Okay, so which subspaces can I get? Well, I could intersect none of them and I get the vector space I started with. I can take any line itself, intersect the line with itself, I get these three lines. And then if I intersect two of the lines, like this one and this one, then I get the origin. And if I intersect three of the lines, I still get the origin. So I don't get any new subspaces. I've written all of the subspaces down. Okay, and um, this is ranked. This is a ranked lattice by co-dimension of the subspace. 
So let's write this in a different color. So the rank is, is co-dimension. So the co-dimension of, of the origin is two, co-dimension one, co-dimension zero of these subspaces. And I'm just a, a bit of notation here. Um, so the elements of rank zero, I'll write L super zero, the elements of rank one, the elements of rank two, and so on. So this is a lattice and it's, it's ordered by uh, reverse inclusion. So like this, the origin is contained inside each of these lines and each of these lines is contained inside of the vector space. Okay, so I have a ranked lattice. And the first, the first question, the first conjecture is called this top heavy conjecture and it's a conjecture about the shape of this lattice. But this is so symmetric. Let me now um, let me now give you the next example. So this is taken from from the pre-seminar. So the second example is maybe I should draw it again because I've changed notation. Let me do that. So let's say if I have four planes in three space, all intersecting in the origin. Okay, so I have my vector space V, which is a three dimensional vector space. I have my four planes. And then now, um, so I have these four planes, their intersection is the origin, and now I can intersect any two of the planes and get a line. Okay, so if I intersect plane one and plane two, I get a line and I'll just call this H12, just to be short. Okay. We assume that the plane's normal vectors are linearly independent, or sorry, um, in general position. Yeah, that, that, well, I don't necessarily, I don't assume that. I mean, I could have two planes on top of each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't so, want all of the planes on top of each other because the intersection won't be the origin. Well, if two of them were on top of each, of each other, then their intersection would, not be a distinct flat, right? Uh, it's not. It's not a problem. You can do this. You can have all of these degeneracies. Yeah, it's totally. Maybe, fine. maybe the question is about the specific example. For example, two. Ah, uh, for this particular example, that yeah, for this particular example, I don't want things lying on top of each other. I want this general position. That's correct. Sorry. Yeah, but in general, I allow all sorts of things. I just, in general, I just want the intersection of all of them to be the, to be the origin. Thank you. Yeah, so so then I have these, these can, so so all of the plane, planes are contained in the vector space. Each of this, the six lines, uh, I can write down their containments, right? They're contained inside of that plane and so on. I keep drawing these, right? And it's not so nice. Three, 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 and four, 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 here, 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 here. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the lines are. What's important is that how many elements there are for, for what I'm trying to discuss. So I draw, what does this top heavy conjecture say? It says that if I draw a horizontal line through the middle of the poset, then I start at the top and I go down some number of levels, but don't cross this horizontal line and then start at the bottom and go up the same number of levels and I compare the number of flats at complementary ranks. Then I have more flats on the top than on the bottom. So what I mean is that if I compare this level to this level, I get one is greater than or equal one, that's fine. And then if I compare this one to this one, I get six is greater than or equal four, okay? So the top heavy conjecture says you always have greater than or equal to here if you compare complementary rings. Okay, so let me, let me write this down. So here is the top heavy conjecture and I'll write down sort of the main theorems in this cyan color. So this was conjectured by Dowling and Wilson in 1974. 
it's, it's what I explained to you for every K less than or equal to one half the dimension of the vector space. So this is that horizontal line that I drew. The number of, of subspaces of, of co-dimension K is less than or equal to the number of subspaces of dimension K. Okay. So this is this top heavy conjecture. Okay, everybody understand the conjecture? Is this okay? Okay. So let me tell you about the second thing, which is a conjecture about the, the coefficients of these Kajanistic polynomials. So let me tell you what these polynomials are. So first I'll give you a definition and I put it in, in quotes because it's a heuristic definition. It's easy to remember. It's easier to remember than the one I wrote in the pre-seminar for the characteristic polynomial, but it only makes sense over a finite field. So let's let V be a vector space over the finite field with T elements. I know I should use Q, but I am using T for all of my variables. Okay, so the characteristic polynomial of the hyperplane arrangement A is, so what it is is I take the polynomial that counts points in the complement of the hyperplane arrangement. So I take the vector space and I remove all of the hyperplanes and I count points over a finite field. So for me, this is easier to remember than the sort of more combinatorial thing that I wrote earlier. So Let's, let's go back and, and compute this for the first example. So here um, in example one, I want to remove these three hyperplanes and I'm working over a finite field with T elements. And I wanna just count how many points I have. So the characteristic polynomial is, well, I have T squared many points for the vector space itself. And now I'm removing the three lines. So I subtract three T, but now I've removed the origin too many times. Okay, because I subtracted the three lines. I subtracted the origin too many times. I subtracted it three times, so I have to add it back in twice. Okay, so this is the characteristic polynomial. And you don't have to work over, I mean, for this definition, you have to work over a finite field, but I assure you there's a definition that works over any fields, but this is just sort of the heuristic definition. That's why I put quotes, easy to remember. Okay, so sort of doing the same thing as I did in the pre-seminar, but from a different perspective. So let's talk about new hyperplane arrangements from old ones. So for every F in the lattice, uh, the intersection lattice, the lattice of flats of my hyperplane arrangement. I have two new lattice of flats. So if I take everything below um, F or everything above F, these are again lattices of flats for other arrangements. So what you what you do is you, it, I mean, one, you intersect um, all of the hyperplanes with this F and one, you take the quotient, okay? So that's how you get new hyperplane arrangements that are either the lower or upper intervals. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this as L sub L of A super F and L of A sub F for these two lattices. Okay, so what are the Kajanistic polynomials? So this is the last thing I wrote in the pre-seminar, seminar, but for matroids. So this was defined by Elias Proudfoot and Wakefield in 2016. And it says for every hyperplane arrangement, A, there exists a unique polynomial P A of T with integer coefficients satisfying three properties. And it's a, it's a theorem because one has to prove the existence of such polynomials. So if the dimension of the vector space is zero, the Kajan-Lustig polynomial is one. 
if the dimension of the vector space is positive, then there's a degree bound. So the degree of the polynomial is strictly less than one half the dimension of the vector space. And the last one is a recursion that allows me to define the Kajan Lustig polynomials in terms of Kajan Lustig polynomials for other matroids. So this left hand side is equal to the sum over all the flats in the lattice of flats. The characteristic polynomial for the lower interval times the Kajan Lustig polynomial for the upper interval. Okay. So the second problem I wanted to talk to, so the talk about the first problem was about the shape of this lattice of flats being top heavy, right? And the second problem is that these crazy polynomials that are defined by this, this recursion have non-negative coefficients. So there's a theorem by the same Elias Proudfoot and Wakefield that defined them in the same paper, they proved that for hyperplane arrangements, the kajan lustig polynomials have non-negative coefficients. Okay. So, so everybody understands the, the, two, the two problems, right? We have the top-heavy conjecture and we have the non-negativity of these kajan lustig polynomials. And for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is see, there's this notion of realizable or representable matroid, which means hyperplane arrangement for the purposes of this talk, okay? So when you have hyperplane arrangements, this is a nice special class of matroids and you have a bunch of geometry and we're going to, I'm gonna show you the proofs of both of these, these problems. I'm gonna solve both of these problems for hyperplane arrangements, okay? They have beautiful geometric proofs. And then afterwards, um, I'll tell you about what we did in our, in our main paper, which is to prove these two conjectures for all matroids. And there you don't have geometry. So you have to sort of emulate the geometry, but there it doesn't exist any. Okay. So that's what, that's the plan for the rest. Okay. So part two is about the proofs when you, when you're in the case of hyperplane arrangements or realizable matrix. Let's see, I see a question. Should I Let's see? You know, we'll interrupt you if there's okay. a need to, but otherwise we, it's kind of fun to sometimes have the chat as a side conversation. Yeah, yeah, you, you guys can try to work it out. We'll save then, it for you, yeah, and then you yeah, can yeah. see all the things, yeah. Cool, yeah, sounds good. All right, so yeah, interrupt me if, if you have a question. Okay, so I won't monitor chat anymore, but please do interrupt me. Okay, so this is, um, so what I'm about to explain to you, all of this geometry um, will, will prove these two conjectures. So, okay, so I have my vector space V and what I can do is I can consider the quotient map where I quotient by one of these hyperplanes. Okay, and let's now consider the sum of all of them. So I sum up all of these quotient maps, one for each hyperplane, for every hyperplane in my arrangement. Now, remember I have this condition that the interse intersection of all of the hyperplanes is the origin. So that makes the sum of all of these quotient maps an injection, an injection. okay? So now um, see this V mod H, well, H is a hyperplane, so it means it's co-dimension one. So V mod H is just a line. It's an affine line. So I have a bunch of lines. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, compactify each of one of these lines by adding a point at infinity. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna embed this inside of a product of P1s, one for each hyperplane. Okay, so I added a, a point of, at infinity for each one of these hyperplanes. Okay, so let me give you a definition now. And this definition is the main sort of geometric object in our in this talk. So the Schubert variety of a hyperplane arrangement is, so what I do, I'm gonna call it Y sub A. 
And it's defined to be the closure of my vector space inside this product of P1s. Okay. All right, so let me do an example. So in example one, remember example one was the one that had three lines inside of a two dimensional space, okay? So just to give you some idea of what this looks like, and I'll tell you a lot of properties of this variety, the Schubert variety. So in a neighborhood of the origin, so sort of on one side of the world, it looks like the vector space I started with. And, but I've, I've added points at infinity all the way on the other side of the world. So in a neighborhood of the point infinity, 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 what this variety looks like is an affine cone. So this here is the point infinity, infinity, infinity. Right. Shouldn't it be three dimensional though? Why? Well, because we have three coordinates. Yeah, but it is. There's a cone there. Oh, I, I meant the uh, the original one. Or, or mm, oh, you're you're you mean the Schubert variety is two dimensional? I mean, I'm just showing what it looks like in. I'm sorry. In, I'm, I'm wondering what you mean by it. The Schubert variety. The oh, Schubert okay. variety looks like in the neighborhood of the origin. It looks like the vector space, and in the neighborhood of infinity, 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 it looks like this two dimensional cone. Is that okay? It's two dimensional in both of these neighborhoods. I, I guess I, I don't see why that is at all. And if there's time, I'd like yeah, to- Yeah, I, I haven't why. explained any, you should not yet. I haven't explained anything. I'm gonna tell you more and then you can ask your question again if you want. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, so let me say a little bit more. So it has a stratification. I mean, you can write down equations for all of this. Um, and then I, but I, I don't want to right now because of time constraints. But I could say after if you want, and we can talk more. Okay, so why has a stratification by affine spaces? So what this means is I can, I can break this thing into a bunch of affine spaces. And let me tell you the definition of each of these pieces, each of these strata. So each of these y sub f is defined to be the points in y such that the coordinate corresponding to the hyperplane h is not infinity if and only if the flat is contained inside the hyperplane, the flat labeling the stratum. Okay, so let me do some two of the sort of most extreme examples. So at the bottom of my post set, I had the vector space was, was the bottom flat. Okay, and if you go through this definition, you're going to get that um, everything should be infinity. Okay. Because the vector space is not contained in any of the hyperplanes, so all the coordinates should be infinity. Okay. And sort of the opposite extreme at the origin, you get the vector space itself. This is all the coordinates are not infinity, okay? Another way to describe the stratum, so there's a group action. So the vector space V acts on itself by translation, just by adding elements, okay? And so it acts on its closure, which is the Schubert variety. So V acts on the Schubert variety and it breaks it up into orbits. And this is, this is one of the orbits with stabilizer F. So these are orbits for the translation action. Okay. And maybe now, I mean, that I've given the stratification. So sort of the, the biggest stratum is isomorphic to the vector space itself. Okay. So it's two dimensional in this example. Okay, so let me tell you some consequence of having a stratification by affine spaces. 
So if you have, if you have a stratification by affine spaces, uh, we have this nice cell decomposition in this case. So if I take the 2K degree cohomology of my Schubert variety, since these strata are labeled by the flats in the lattice, this dimension is the number of flats of rank K. Okay, just because it has this stratification by affine spaces. So I'm saying a lot of stuff, but I'm going to remind you what we're doing. We're trying to prove this top heavy conjecture first. Okay. And the second consequence is a theorem by Bjorner and Ekedal in this, in, it's a really beautiful paper called On the Shape of Bruja Intervals. So, so it says, mm -hmm. sorry, what's P sub H? P sub H is the coordinate corresponding to the hyperplane H. Okay, so it says that the, the cohomology injects in something called the intersection cohomology. This is just, this has nothing to do with my Schubert variety Y. This is just having anything that has a stratification by affine spaces has this property. So what is this intersection cohomology? So intersection cohomology is sort of the right cohomology theory for singular varieties, okay? So all the nice theorems that are true for smooth varieties for your usual singular cohomology are true for singular varieties when you talk about intersection cohomology, okay? So these varieties are, are singular and here's a singularity, okay? So this intersection cohomology is going to be useful. Okay, let's, let's look back at this top heavy conjecture. Let me scroll back up. So this top heavy conjecture here says that the number of flats of rank K should be less than or equal to the number of flats of rank the top, the dimension of the vector space minus K. Okay, top minus K. So we can prove this by looking at this variety because of number one here. So number one tells us that, well, this is one of the numbers that appears in the top heavy conjecture, okay? So what we want to show, we want the number of flats of rank K to be less than or equal to the number of flats of complementary degree on the top, okay? And by number one, this means, well, this is equal to some, something about these dimensions of these degrees of cohomology. Okay. So you agree that the dimensions of these spaces I just wrote down are, are exactly the numbers on the left. So what I need to do is I need an injection. If somehow I can come up, invent some kind of injection, then I've proven the top heavy conjecture. Wait, what, what sort of homology is this or cohomology? This is just the like singular cohomology. The, the basic thing from algebraic topology, nothing, nothing fancy, just ordinary singular cohomology. So you agree that if I get an injection, then I have proven that the, I have a, uh, this number smaller than this number. Okay. So I need an injection. Okay. So what I'm about to say, I mean, is a bit of, um, I mean, you, sh you have to take some of this as a black box if you haven't seen intersection cohomology and stuff like this. But if you take these two, these two facts and one more thing, which is called the hard left shed's theorem, which I'll, I'll mention, then the proof is very easy, okay? Like it's really, really beautiful. So let me tell you what this hard left shed's theorem says. It says that if I take a particular element of H2 of Y, the degree two, that's called ample. Okay. And if K is less than or equal to one half the dimension of the vector space, this is my line through the middle. Then what do I have, right? So 
Number two here, this Bjorner Ekedal result says that cohomology injects inside intersection cohomology. So I have these two injections. Okay. And what I do want is I want an injection here. So this is Bjorner Ekedal. Okay. So the hard left shets theorem. So okay, the hard left shets theorem says that if I multiply enough times by this this L, this ample class, this whatever this degree two element is, the special degree two elements, then I get an isomorphism. Okay. So it says if I start in some degree and I multiply enough by L to get to the complementary degree, then that is an isomorphism. That's what it says. Okay. And this is true if you have smooth varieties for our usual cohomology, but our variety Y is not smooth. So that's why we have to go to this intersection cohomology. This intersection cohomology has the hard left sets theorem for singular projective varieties, okay? So what we use is we use this hard left sets theorem here. So we multiply enough times by this L just to get to the complementary degree, okay? And the hard left sheds theorem says this is an isomorphism. And now I just want to restrict this multiplication. So I can multiply enough times by L, but th this is an inclusion. So I just restrict the multiplication to here. Okay. So I'm going to restrict the multiplication. It's the same multiplication map. And now I just have a commutative diagram. I have a commutative diagram with an isomorphism here and two injections. So if I have a commutative diagram with an isomorphism and two injections, that, that means that this must also be an injection. Okay, and we're done. So this was the proof by Jun He and Bo Tong Wong in 2017. So Dowling and Wilson conjectured this in 1974 and it took 43 years to prove this. So this is the top heavy conjecture. So you have to invent the right variety, the Schubert variety for hyperplane arrangements. Okay. So this is the top heavy conjecture proof. Let me tell you a, a, a proof for the non-negativity of the kazan lustig polynomials. And this is in the same paper where the kazan lustig polynomials were defined, Elias, Proudfoot, and Wakefield. So it says that if I look at the kajan lustig polynomial of a hyperplane arrangement, this is this thing defined recursively, then this is some kind of Poincaré polynomial. So it's the dimension, so the coefficients are the dimension of the intersection cohomology of my Schubert variety, but I have to take a stock at the most singular point. So is there a question? What's IH? Intersection cohomology. Yeah, so uh, this is just the so a nice cohomology theory for singular varieties. Yeah, so IH means intersection cohomology. What's the stratification thing used in that proof? What's the significance of the stratification? Yeah, so it's used for two things. I mean, like really all I used was that it was the strata are labeled by flats. So this part. And the, the most important thing is that they're all affine spaces. So they're a vector space mod a subspace. So they're, they're, they're just an affine space. So because you have a stratification by affine spaces, you get these two. Th these are two con consequences. Oh, you, have okay. spaces, you get these two things. So the first one's used to, to have the numerology to be correct, to get the top heavy conjecture numerology. And the second one is, is to have these two injections. Yep. So I have a question too, if I yeah. from doing interruptions for a sec. So yeah, you have this little subscript E infinity Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What does that mean down there? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So okay. So 
there are two different ways. I mean, one way to- Does that mean wait. when you localize the intersection cohomology at that particular point, take the dimension there? Yeah, it doesn't mean localization in like in terms of rings and modules. It means like sheaf theoretically, it means like take the stock of the sheaf. At yeah, the most yeah, okay. Point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but because there's an intersection cohomology sheaf and you can take a stock and th this is the cohomology of that sheaf, the intersection cohomology. Um, but later, I mean, so when we do this for, for arbitrary matroids, we have no geometry. So this IH is going to be a module. And, um, and then this infinity, infinity, infinity just means some quotient of the module. Okay, so any other questions? So this implies the non-negativity, right? Like the coefficients are non-negative now because they're dimensions of something. Okay. Okay, how, how many people in this audience uh, have, has seen um, classical Kajdan Lustig theory for vial groups and Schubert varieties and stuff like this? Okay, Sarah, Isabella, few. Okay, our board. Okay, let, let, let me just Monty. Okay, <laughs> of course. Yeah. All right. Let let me for for the few people. Let me just I set up this table so I won't spend too much time. Maybe two or three minutes. Um, that, that compare and contrast the, the two theories, okay? So the left-hand side is the classical one and the right-hand side is the one for matroids. And like I said, if you, if, you, if you haven't seen the classical theory before, just relax for a couple minutes and then we'll go back to the story, okay? This is just if you've seen this before. So um, in the classical story, you have a vial group for, for some Lie algebra and the hyperplane arrangement is playing this role, okay? And then um, you have an arbitrary Coxeter group, which there's not a flag variety associated to that. You don't have geometry in that, in that case. Um, and this is the arbitrary matroid, you should think. And then you have a Bruja poset, which is my lattice of flats. You have these R polynomials, which are um, sort of simpler polynomials that you use to build the Kajan Lustig polynomials recursively. These are my characteristic polynomials. Um, you have a Schubert variety inside like some closed sub variety of the flag variety. That, that's my Schubert variety, okay? Um, so these are, all of the, these are all of the similarities, okay? And let me just skip down to the last one. So um, Elias and Williams, so it was conjectured by Kajan and Lustig back in the sort of, I don't know, late seventies or early eighties that the coefficient should be non-negative for, for all Coxeter groups. And it was proven by um, Ben Elias and Jordy Williamson in 2014 using Zergel by modules that they were, the coefficients were non-negative. And this is what we prove um, for arbitrary matroids. Um, so let's, let's go to this one. Here is a difference. So everything I've said is, has been sort of similar so far. So there's this theorem on the classical side by Patrick Polo in 1999 that says Kajan Lucy polynomials are common. Like they're not special as polynomials. They're very, they encode lots of special information, but as polynomials, they're, they're sort of common. So what it means is that I, I think the statement is that um, every polynomial with non-negative coefficients and constant term one is already a kajlan lustig polynomial for some symmetric group. That's close, um, but it, it is, you do need to have non-negative integer coefficients. Ah, thank you, non-negative integer coefficients. Right, so, so a lot of polynomials are kajlan lustig polynomials. Um, so on, on this side, there's a conjecture by Gideon, Proudfoot, and Young that says that these are real rooted. So real, being real rooted is very special um, property of a polynomial, not many polynomials are real rooted. So the polynomials are very different in that, in that case. Okay, so I just wanted to say this in case you've seen it. And there's sort of a lot more to that, that story, of course, um, you can ask later. Okay, so the last part of the talk is what do you do when you don't have geometry? What do you do for arbitrary matroids? So I've told you sort of how to handle what, what the proofs look like whenever you have realizable matroids or what I, what I call hyperplane arrangements. Um, so I want to tell you about this top heavy and non-negativity non for arbitrary matroids. Okay, 
So first thing I, I want to argue is that I, I won't give the definition of matroid, but I'll, I'll tell you that, I mean, matroids have a lattice of flats. So they have this nice post set that I've been working with, this nice lattice, ranked lattice. And I'm gonna call it L of M now instead of L of A, because I'm talking about general matroids. And they have a rank function. So we have a, a ranked lattice. Okay, so I could ask, what is the shape of this ranked lattice? So the top heavy conjecture makes sense. And you literally copy the same definition. Um, there's, you can take a matroid for an upper interval and matroid for a lower interval. And you can, there's a characteristic polynomial of a matroid that purely makes sense in terms of lattice of flats. So you can define this Kajanlistic polynomial of a matroid. And you can ask whether it has non-negative coefficients or not. Okay, so both of the problems make sense in this more general setting. But before I talk about the proof, I want to stress that um, there's a big gap between hyperplane arrangements and all matroids. Okay, so most matroids are not realizable. So you, you can't like uh, make a hyperplane arrangement over some field that realizes the matroid. So let me, let me be precise here. Let me explain why, like in what sense most matroids are not realizable. So I'm gonna let R sub N be the number of realizable matroids with N elements. So you should think like hyperplane arrangements within hyperplanes, okay? And MN is just gonna be the number of matroids within elements, okay? Then there's a theorem by Nelson in 2018 that says that if you look at the ratio of the number of realizable matroids on n elements to the number of matroids on n elements and you let the number of elements go to infinity then this ratio goes to zero okay so this is what I mean by most matroids are not realizable okay so I want to try to explain a little bit about the proof of, of these two for all matroids. So let's look back at, at what did I do, right? So I had this commutative diagram. This is sort of the most important thing, okay? And for the top heavy conjecture, I had this commutative diagram and I had this cohomology of the Schubert variety and this intersection of cohomology of the Schubert variety. So one might, think that a good way to go is to make some kind of combinatorial object that plays the role of cohomology and intersection cohomology, but makes sense for any matroid that doesn't depend on the Schubert variety. So this is what we do. So a definition. So let me tell you what plays the role of the cohomology of the Schubert variety. So this is called the graded Mobius algebra of the lattice of flats. The graded Mobius algebra of M is, so I'm going to use this. This is just notation. It doesn't mean cohomology of anything, OK? It's just supposed to remind you. So as a vector space, it has a basis given by some elements called Y sub F, some symbols called Y sub F, one for each flat. And I'm going to place these generators in degree rank of f, okay, the rank of the flat. So that's what it is as a vector space, but I said it's an algebra, so I should tell you what the multiplication is. So it has multiplication, it's very simple. So if I multiply two of these basis elements, yf times yg, well, so it's either- What's that symbol to the left of the yf? So, oh, Q. Oh, that's a Q. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like the rationals. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, just the rationals. Yeah, I don't know if that's better. <laughs> yep. Okay. It, it so looks sort of like a circled H, so I was confused. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So the product is just um, the, the basis element corresponding to um, the join in the lattice of flats. So the unique guy, minimal guy above these two. 
if the rank, the ranks are work out to be correct when you add them. So if the rank of F plus the rank of G is equal to the rank of the join. Another thing that could happen is the rank of the sum is bigger than the rank of the join. And in that case, you get zero. So it's a very simple algebra, okay? And the theorem by He and Wong in the same paper that proves the top heavy conjecture for our hyperplane arrangements is that this graded Mobius algebra is, is the cohomology of the Schubert variety when the, the hyperplane arrangement realizes the matroid. So if you have a realizable matroid, then everything matches up. Okay. So let me try to finish up here. So what, what remains now is to, to talk about what plays the role of intersection cohomology. Intersection cohomology is, is, is sort of a notoriously difficult thing to get your hands on. So we don't have a nice object that we can just define as intersection cohomology straight away. We have to sort of go round about. So what we do is remember this, this Schubert variety is, is singular. So we define some explicit resolution, some smooth variety that resolves this, this Schubert variety. And we can, talk of, we can understand combinatorially the cohomology of that. Okay, so the theorem of Braden, He, uh, myself, Proudfoot, and Wong last year is that there's this thing called the augmented chow ring of a matroid, which I won't define right now anyway. And this is the cohomology of this resolution when A realizes M. Okay. And this is defined purely in terms of the lattice of flats. So now I'll just tell you the, the strategy for the proof. And by the way, this is, this is defined in the smaller paper. I said there are two papers. The one that's not highlighted at the top. So now the strategy of the proof is, is basically to do the same thing that we did with this commutative diagram. But with these two combinatorial objects, you can define purely in terms of the lattice of flats. But we still don't have a handle on intersection cohomology. So geometrically, what we have is that, remember there's this burner ekadol injection, cohomology is inside intersection cohomology because we have a stratification by affine spaces. And this is inside the cohomology of the resolution. So we understand this combinatorially. This is the graded Mobius algebra. We understand this combinatorially. This is the augmented chow ring of a matroid. But we don't yet have this combinatorially, which is important for this commutative diagram. So what we do is we decompose this augmented chow ring as a module over this graded Mobius algebra and find a nice sum n that plays the role of this intersection cohomology. Okay, so we decompose the augmented chow ring as an H of M module, module over the greatest mo greater Mobius algebra. And when you do this, you can find a nice sum N. I'm not giving any details, so don't, don't feel bad if you, know, you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying what, what any of these things are but you can ask me and I can tell you a little bit more. It's a long story. So I find a nice sum and I call the intersection cohomology of a matroid that plays the role of this IH of Y. And I, I prove that I have an injection, this bjorner ekadol type injection from the graded Mobius algebra to this module, this intersection cohomology module. And then remember the whole thing that made this commutative diagram work is I needed this hard left shed's theorem. I needed to multiply by this element enough times to get an isomorphism. So I come up with a suitable element. We do this and we prove a hard left shed's theorem for the intersection cohomology module of a matroid. And then now you can just run the same argument with this commutative diagram. 
And this, this gives you, so the commuter diagram gives you the top heavy conjecture for all matroids. And let me tell you, finally, the second answer to the second question. So the kajan lustig polynomial matroid is the Poincaré polynomial of something having to do with this intersection cohomology module. So I take this intersection cohomology module and I tensor over H of M with Q. So I kill the action of the, of the basis vectors corresponding to the yi's. I mean, corresponding to the i's, to the elements of the matroid. So it's a quotient, it's, it's of, of i h of m by the action of some of the elements of the Mobius algebra, okay? So this, is the, this, is, so this gives you the non-negativity because it's dimensions of something once again. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Let's thank Jacob for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question if. Yeah. So I'm curious. How much of this kind of would work then if you try to do um, kajdan lustig theory for finite reflection groups, finite complex reflection groups, I mean, not uh -huh. just bio groups. Right, I see. And not just coxeter groups. But right, go beyond groups. that. Well, right, or, right. you know, sort of a little different than that. Is Monty still here? Maybe he knows the answer to this. Oh, I don't. You don't, right. okay. Yeah, so. I, I don't know the answer to it, um, but here's something that you you may already know, Sarah. Um, there's this there's this work by Richard Stanley from the '80s or something, maybe it's '80s or '90s. Paper, yeah. It, yeah, it's a it's a paper that, yeah, he's doing something else. I forgot what, but in in the paper he develops um, what's now called kajan lustig stanley polynomials. Um, so this is this says that if you have hmm. um, a lattice that's locally finite and has a rank function satisfying some properties. And then he uses some terminology called a p-kernel, which is basically like the R polynomial or the characteristic polynomial. So he axiomatizes what that means. Um, then he, out of this general setup, he shows you how to um, produce a left kajan lustig polynomial and a right kajan lustig polynomial. And um, well, I think in the classical setting, uh, you get either the kajan lustig polynomial, one of them is the ordinary kajan lustig polynomial, and one is like the kajan lustig polynomial where you multiply both the words by the longest element or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And for our setup, it's, it's a, one of the, the left kajan lustig polynomial is all one. And this has to do geometrically because the like the variety is smooth in the neighborhood mm -hmm. of zero, zero, zero. It looks like the vector space. There's no, no singularities because um, intersection cohomology is sort of about sing singularities. And, mm -hmm. and the right kajan lustig polynomial is the one that I, I defined. Um, so this is all a long story to say, I wonder if um, complex reflection groups fit into Stanley's framework. I think that's a good tip, good yeah, idea. Sorry. I don't know. Think I don't know. But um, there, there's a paper by um, Nick Proudfoot recently. It's a survey paper. It's called The Algebraic Geometry of kajan lustig stanley Polynomials. And this is, a, I think, a good place to read about this general Stanley setup. I mean, if you want it isolated, like, you know, a paper that treats just this. And he, he takes like four different examples, affine Grassmannians and classical kajan lustig polynomials and hypertory varieties or something. And, he sort of explains how all of these fit into Stanley's framework. So it'd be a nice place to look maybe. Yeah, I'm looking it up as we speak. I'll put it on the chat. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip. Are there other questions? I have, I have kind of a small one. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. That was, that was really interesting. I liked it. Um, I, the, the question that I had, I guess, is maybe not exactly related to the, the sort of big picture of what you were saying, but you mentioned uh, the result that most matroids are not representable. Um, I had two questions about that, if, if you happen to know. 
uh, how quickly that ratio goes to zero. And then also if you fix a rank, is that still true or are there sort of different ranks where it behaves differently? Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to either of your questions, but they're very interesting. I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at, at the paper embarrassingly. I mean, I, I, you know, I bring it up in talks all the time, but I, I, have, I don't know how it's proven. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 please, and tell me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool result. I didn't know about that, actually, that you get the asymptotics that way. Wonderful. Yeah, so I, I want to, um, I want to now say another thing because it's it's related. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows this class of sparse paving matroids. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what it what it is off the top of my head, but there's some large class of matroids called sparse paving matroids, and it's it's really a large class. So in in the sense that um, I think like most matroids are sparse paving in sort of a similar sense um, to 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 this. To this Nelson result. So what I mean is that um, I think what's proven is that if you take um, the ratio of the logs of the number of sparse paving matroids, like the log of the number of sparse paving matroids on n elements divided by the log of the number of matroids on n elements, um, then, then that's one as the number of elements go to infinity. So most matroids are sparse paving, but it's conjectured that you can remove the logs. Um, so anyway, um, I bring this up because there's a there's a cool paper that's sort of like um, kind of side by side with ours, but entirely different. So, so you know, we prove that all Kajian Lucic polynomials for all matroids have non-negative coefficients, but we go through like this very heavy kind of machinery, right? Um, all this emulating this algebraic geometry. There's a paper by um, Kyung Young Lee and uh, George Nazer and Jamie Radcliffe. Um, that prove that all sparse paving matroids have non-negative coefficients. And they do this purely combinatorially. I mean, they, they somehow cook up these, these uh, skew tableau and talk about certain fillings of this skew tableau. And then and they count them, they like interpret the coefficients in terms of like numbers of fillings or something like this. And, um, and it's, it's amazing to me that like purely combinatorially, you can get so close. Like they, like sparse paving matroids are are very close to all matroids, um, but sort of we have to do all of this technical stuff to get all the way. So I don't know. It's a it's a very cool. Like the techniques are completely different. It's, so it's nice. I can link that in the chat as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Feel free to ask other questions too that it end up being a few high level questions, but you're Yeah, and anything not even ask. related to what I'm talking about. I mean, like sort of, I mean, well, you know, you know I mean, when will I get a haircut again? I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. on that actually. <laughs> yeah, so this this paper that I, that I linked is, is the one about sparse paving matroids. It's purely combinatorial. It's quite nice. Oh, that's great. And maybe while we're chatting over coffee here, uh, we'll bring up the Nelson paper too. Uh, but yeah. if there are any other questions, shall we thank the speaker one more time and sort of have a little coffee break time? So thanks, Jacob. That was an absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you for having me. <laughs>